Okay, here we are, part three, encounters. Thank you for braving the weather and getting here. I'm so glad we're here, though. Aren't we glad? Um, so we're going to begin with our foundational verses, the one from the New Testament and then the promise from the Old Testament. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. When I seek the Lord my God, I will find him if I seek him with all my heart and with all my soul. So he came to give us abundant life, and he promises that we will find it if we seek him. He is there to offer it to us, and so we're seeking him. In this whole series, we're talking about Jesus and learning more about him. And um, I've been looking at my chronological Bible for the sequence of his encounters, and um, the next one is actually the wedding feast where he turns the water into wine, but we're going to skip over that. We might go back to it, but I felt led more to chapters 3 and 4 in John, and we're going to look at two different encounters, and they don't seem like they go together, but this series was inspired by a book I read by Tim Keller called Encounters with Jesus, and much of what we're going to talk about today I pull from this book. So you're going to see in the notes that I'm constant, you know, this is like, Tim Keller speaking today in my body. <laughs> it's me, but much of this comes from Tim Keller, okay? So I just want to say that up front so I don't have to keep saying it over again. <laughs> but anyway, um, so when I read this chapter in his book, it's like, no, these two really do go together, these two encounters. And so the two encounters are the, um, the insider and the outcast, okay? Now, there's no way to talk about these two encounters without addressing the subject of sin. And we shudder at the word sin and sinner, um, mostly because these words have been used as weapons to marginalize people. But the truth is we are all sinners, and we get that if we understand what the definition of sin really is. So we're going to start with the outcast, because she, um, this the outcast is a sinner that most people would recognize as sin. The insider, not so recognizable. So we're going to start with the out outcast. And this encounter is the woman at the well, and it's a very familiar story. Um, it's found in John chapter 4. So Jesus is traveling with his disciples through Samaria, which is outside of Judea. And we get when he gets to town, his disciples leave to go off and get something to eat. And Jesus is very tired. He's weary, and he's thirsty. And it's the sixth hour of the day, so it's about noon. And uh, it's in the heat of the day, so he goes to a well. But he has no way of getting water out of the well because he doesn't have a jar. And so then this solitary woman comes in the heat of the day to draw water from the well. And Jesus says to her, Please give me a drink. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir... You don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, welling up to eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. 
you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. All right, so before we continue the encounter, we want to just um, make note of how remarkable this conversation really is. Um, the first striking feature is the radical move Jesus makes by initiating a conversation with this woman. And it doesn't really seem unusual to us, but in that culture, it really was. Um, and so, and she even seemed shocked by it, that he would speak to her, a Jew, um, and speaking to a Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans were enemies. And so Jesus was modeling what he would later teach about. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. So centuries before, most of the Jews were exiled to Babylon by their conquerors, and some of the Jews who stayed behind intermarried with the other Canaanites, um, and essentially they formed their own new little tribe, which was called the Samaritans. So they took parts of the Jewish religion that they liked, and they took parts of the Canaanite religion that they liked, and they kind of made up their own religion. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> we see a lot of this going on today. So the Jews looked down their noses at the Samaritans as racially inferior because they were mixed and as apostates because of their religion was a little bit of, you know, whatever they wanted. So you can see why the Jews felt this way, for God had commanded them not to intermarry. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. So that's the first reason she's surprised he's speaking to her. But on top of that, it was scandalous for a Jewish man to be speaking to um, a strange woman or any woman in public, really. And so she saw something different right from the beginning about Jesus' attitude toward her. And he's modeling. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. Let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. What's more, she'd come to draw water at noon. And that's not when women would ordinarily draw the water. They would go um, together in a group, and they would draw the water early in the morning when it was still cool. And then it was what they used for their daily chores all day. So why was she here in the middle of the day all by herself? Well, it was because she was a moral outcast. She was a complete outsider, even within her own marginalized part of society. So when Jesus speaks to her, he is deliberately reaching across almost every significant barrier that people can put up between themselves. He's reaching across the racial barrier, the cultural barrier, the gender barrier, of the moral barrier, and basically every convention of his time, he's breaking through in them all. He, a religious Jewish male, should have had nothing whatsoever to do with this woman. He doesn't care. Do you see how radical that is? He reaches right across all the human divides, divides that we set up against each other, and he does that in order to connect with her. So, just stop right there. Is there anybody in your life that there's a barrier, barrier between you and them for whatever reason? There's just a barrier there. And has it come between you? Jesus has come to break through all barriers. It's not his way. Barriers are not his way. Jesus breaks barriers and he builds bridges. That was his mission for coming to earth. That is his mission. He continues today, and he does it through you and through me.
He wants to break down barriers. He wants to build bridges. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air. For he is himself our peace, our bond of unity and harmony. He has made us both Jew and Gentile, one body, and has broken down, destroyed, abolished, the hostile dividing wall between us. So you notice I've pulled a couple of passages from the message. And the message is a paraphrase, if you're not familiar with it. And I, don't, I do not study from the message, but I sometimes will refer to it just to get a fresh look at a passage I read over and over. So because these two stories are so familiar, I found it helpful to pull in some of the message because they gave me a fresh way of looking at things. Um, and then the Amplified is another one that brings in lots of extra, you know, just amplifies is what it does. So, so you'll notice in this lesson I'm doing that more often than I generally do. But anyway, the second interesting feature about this encounter is that though he is clearly open and warm with this woman, he still confronts her. But he does it in a gentle and artful way. So at our house, my husband is often referred to as the Velvet Hammer. <laughs> it's like he's, all right, now I grew up in a family where you kind of dance around issues, and the Banning family is just, you know, in your face. <laughs> and it took some getting used to. But I will say another thing he does is he uses humor, and, and he'll confront in a way that I can handle. He's learned how to do this very well over the years we've been married. But we call him the velvet hammer. And sometimes I'll say, could we have a little more velvet and a little less hammer? <laughs> but anyway, it's like Jesus had a way of confronting this woman with a velvet hammer. And, and so here's another little passage from the message I thought fit here. Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore them, saving your critical comments for yourself. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens and so complete Christ's law. Don't worry in advance about what to say. Just say what God tells you at that time. For it is not you who will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So Jesus begins by saying something like, and it's based on John 4.10, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. And if you drink that water, you'll never thirst again. So what Jesus is saying to this outcast is, you know, I've got something for you that is as basic and necessary to you spiritually as water is to you physically. Something that without, without it, you're absolutely lost. That's what I'm offering you. Well, if I were to just randomly pick people off the street and say, what will make you happy? What will really give you satisfaction? Most often their answer would be something outside of them. They would most likely say, oh, romantic love, or a career, or the political party of my choice running things for all time, <laughs> you know, um, or maybe money. But this metaphor of the living water means even more than that. Jesus isn't just telling us that what he has to offer is life-saving. He's revealing that it satisfies 
from the inside. You don't need water splashed on your face. You need water that comes from even deeper down inside of you than the thirst itself is. And Jesus is saying, I can give it. I can put it in you. I can give you absolute, unfathomable satisfaction in the core of your being, regardless of what's going on around you. He says, my water, if you get it, will become a fresh bubbling spring within you, welling up to eternal life. It's now, it's present, and it's future. And he's talking about deep soul satisfaction, about incredible satisfaction and contentment that does not depend on circumstances, on anything outside of you. He says, in fact, nothing outside of you can truly satisfy your thirst that's deep down inside of you. Only I can satisfy your soul thirst. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your earnings for what does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness, the profuseness (laughs) of spiritual joy. I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So are you looking for satisfaction in anything or anyone other than Jesus. Be honest. Ken Boa says, satisfaction is the byproduct of the pursuit of God. Satisfaction is the byproduct of the pursuit of God. And so we don't pursue satisfaction. We pursue Jesus, and the byproduct will be satisfaction. So again, We put Jesus in front of everything. Seek first. Psalm 34. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. When we look to anything other than him, we will never find that soul satisfaction we long for. He planted it in us and only he can fill it. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living waters, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. So often we forget how thirsty we are because we believe we can somehow fulfill our our dreams. And we're so busy digging our cisterns that in reality are cracked. Um, that we walk right past Jesus. And so what cistern are you wasting your time and energy on digging only to find it to be cracked? There's a slow leak. And maybe there's a little water for a while, but the reality is it's, it's leaking. And the cistern becomes empty and eventually completely dry. Well, this woman at the well, she has no such illusions. She knows she's thirsty. She knows she's empty. And so the hook is set. And so she says to him, Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water 
Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Then he turns the tables on her. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So why does he do this? Why does he like suddenly seemingly change the subject from living water to her history with men? Well, the answer is he isn't changing the subject. He's basically saying to her, if you want to understand the nature of this living water I have to give, you need to understand how you've been trying to seek it in your own life. You've been trying to get it through men. And you're never going to get it that way. You're going to come up empty every time. And this goes back to our foundational verse for the series where he's saying, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So the enemy is constantly trying to get our eyes on something else so that he can steal from us and rob us. And Jesus has come to give us a rich and satisfying life. Well, now, this woman is shocked by this. And she says, You must be a prophet. And then she goes on to ask him one of the great theological questions of the day. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim? Where our ancestors worshipped. Well, then Jesus answers in verses 21 to 24 with a a remarkable paragraph that's basically summarized by him saying, The time is coming when there will be no need for a physical temple in order to have access to God. And now she's just overwhelmed. And so then she responds, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then finally, Jesus drops the bomb. I am the Messiah. Okay, so that's that encounter. Now we're going to turn back to chapter 3, and we're going to see where Jesus meets a very important man, a Pharisee. He's a religious and civic leader. And let's have Olga read that story. There was a man named Nicodemus a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. So you notice how um, Jesus, the way he operates with this man is completely different than how he operated with the woman, with the way he treated the woman at the well. With her, he started off very gently, and then he surprised her with his openness, and then he slowly confronted her with her spiritual need. But in this encounter with the insider, Jesus is more direct. He's a little more forceful. And so we want to, when we're engaging with people who don't know Jesus, we want to look to him for how how we, we don't do it the same with everybody. And he can give us wisdom for how to engage. Sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's this way. It's not always the same. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. 
Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we look to him for the wisdom, for how to engage. He has the power to touch that soul. Now, Nicodemus begins with courtesy. You know, he says, well, we all know God sent you to teach us, and your miraculous signs show evidence that God is with you. But Jesus confronts him right up, saying, you must be born again. That's the first thing Jesus says to him. Now, Nicodemus has spent his entire life worshiping God according to strict Jewish tradition. Most likely, he was offended by this. Um, Nicodemus is a civic leader. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, the assembly of the Hebrew high court judges. Um, he's prosperous. He's a devout and upstanding Pharisee. You couldn't have had a more religious, you couldn't have any more religious credibility than this. Um, Nicodemus calls Jesus, who's a young man with no training, he calls him rabbi. And so this shows that he's more humble and more open than his counterparts, his peers. So here in Nicodemus, you have an altogether admirable person. He's pulled together. He's successful. He's disciplined. He's moral. He's religious. He's religious yet open-minded. And what does Jesus say? He uses a different metaphor with the insider than he uses with the outcast. Rather than pressing him on his lack of satisfaction, I can give you living water, he presses him on his smug self-satisfaction. You must be born again, is what he said to him. He's basically saying to him, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem each let each esteem others better than himself. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. This is what, I want, what he wants to get across to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Okay, think about it. What did any of you have to do with being born? Did you will it to happen or work hard to earn it? <laughs> we did nothing. We didn't plan it. We had nothing to do with it. And it's the same with being born again. When we have our spiritual new birth, it's a free gift. We don't contribute to it. Salvation is by grace and there are no moral efforts that can earn it or merit it. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Because of his grace, we inherit eternal life. Now, this is an astonishing thing to say to a man like Nicodemus. Jesus is saying that the pimps and the prostitutes out on the street are in the same position spiritually as you are. That's what he's saying to him. Nicodemus, with his, all of his moral and spiritual accomplishments and those on the street that are homeless and addicted, as far as God's concerned, are equally as lost. They both get to start from scratch. They both have to be born again. They both need eternal spiritual life or something's going to eat them alive. And that life is going to be a free gift. Nothing that you can earn or merit. And how can Jesus say this? It's because he's working from a deeper understanding of sin than most people understand, than most people have. Most people would look at the woman at the well and 
right away say, you know, yeah, she's a sinner. She's living with a man, you know, all that. And they would understand. But most people would look at a guy like Nicodemus, especially back in that day, and they would never see him as a sinner in need of salvation. And so why would Jesus tell this good man that all he has done has essentially earned him nothing in, when it comes to heaven? Well, it's because of Jesus' definition of sin. And that definition is sin is looking to any other thing, anything other than God for your salvation. Sin is putting yourself in the place of God, becoming your own Savior and Lord. And that's the biblical definition of sin, and it's the first of the Ten Commandments. And so one way to do this is to break all the moral rules, like the woman at the well. It's uh, just to pursue pleasure and happiness and, you know, just break all the rules, okay? But then there's a religious way to be your own Savior and Lord, and that is to keep all the rules for the wrong reasons, with the wrong motives. To act as if your good life and your moral achievement is actually going to require God to bless you and answer your prayers. And in this case, when you're looking to your own moral goodness and efforts to give you significance and security, you're no different than the ones that are out there looking for it in sex, money, power, whatever, whatever it is. And what is so insidious about this is that religious people constantly talk about trusting in God. But if you think that your goodness is in any way contributing to your salvation, you're actually being your own savior. You're trusting in yourself. And while you may not be out there committing adultery or stealing or murdering or any of that, your heart will increasingly be filled with pride, self-righteousness, insecurity, envy, in spite its sin. And there's a chilling passage in Matthew. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That is a chilling passage. Oh, yes. We want him to know us. We all, you know, we know him, we know God, but we want him to know us. We want to transact. And Paul acknowledged this in Philippians chapter 3 when he listed all his credentials. You know, he was a lot like Nicodemus. But then he goes on to say, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake... I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So what Paul had come to understand was that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman we're equal sinners in need of grace. And so are all of us. And when we try to be our own saviors or our own Lord, we, we, we try to put God in our debt. Jesus calls it sin. For the truth is, and my mom wrote a song called, We Are All the Same at the Foot of the Cross. Next verse, Don. 
Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. When we are trusting in ourselves to behave our way into his righteousness, we're cursed. And Jesus has come to take away that curse and to make a way for us to become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And only Jesus can do this for us. And he says that we need living water and we need to be born again to get salvation. So are you still trying to win God's approval based on your performance? Are you still trying to behave your way into the kingdom? I catch myself frequently thinking, oh, I got to do this, and then somehow he's going to think better of me. It's like, what are you thinking? This is not... Now, I'm not to say that we ignore good works, because when we transact with Jesus, his desires come inside of us, and then good works follow. But when we're trying to do good works in order to get into his good graces, that's where we've got it wrong. That's sin. And so Psalm 46 tells us, Cease striving and know that I am God. Cease striving and receive from him. When we get to stop, we turn to him, and that's called repentance. We want to admit our need and we want to admit um, that we need Jesus to save us. He's our only Savior. And then we get to receive his righteousness. And as we receive his righteousness, he then displaces all of our sin. And it's not until then that we're truly converted, that we've really transacted, that now he knows us, that we become married to him. And there are people sitting in pews across the globe who think I've checked the box and they do not have this level of, you know, they're not connected to him in this way and that those are the ones I never knew you. But we did all these things in your name. Look what we did. I never knew you. This never happened. And so it's really, for me, it's like, Lord, I don't want there to be any part of me that's missing this. I just want to connect with you. Um, E. Stanley Jones talks about this as living on the menu instead of the meat. And he bases this little entry on Obadiah 117. The house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. Oh, on your handout now, Olga, if you'll read there from In Christ. It is possible to have possessions as a possibility. But possessions are only possessions when you possess them. Without possession, we live on a promise, and it is possible to have a promise in your hand and be empty. That would be to live on the menu instead of on the meat. And how many people are doing that? You know, what would you went to a restaurant and you looked at the menu and you had that menu in your hand and you read it all, but you never ordered anything and ate it? <laughs> It's like, how satisfying would that be? Well, a quote here for me, Stanley Jones, was, the menu is what I read. The meat is what I receive. Nicodemus was living on the menu, not on the meat. Well, you may say, well, I'm neither kind of person. I'm not like the woman at the well. I'm not like that. I'm a morally good person. I'm not religious like Nicodemus. You know, I'm a, I'm a good person, and that's all that ma should matter, right? So we had an uncle, Uncle Bud, and he passed away many years ago. But he was that kind of guy. He was a wonderful man, and he was up just involved in his community. He was involved in his church. He was an elder, and he and I really hit it off. And so we would have these lunches together, and we would talk about spiritual things. And I would talk about this concept of knowing Jesus and being born again, and that just no, you know, and he would then he would talk about, boy, you know, that he would talk about his brother-in-law, my father-in-law, 
and say, because he was at that time, you know, not a believer at all, and he was outspoken about it. Oh, you know, he's in trouble. He's but Uncle Bud, if you don't have Jesus, there's no difference, and he couldn't get it until two weeks before he actually went into the arms of Jesus. He did receive Jesus into his heart, and it was a beautiful thing, but he spent almost his whole life and all of his adult life as a Nicodemus kind of guy, and he didn't ever get it, but fortunately he did. But I'm just saying, we don't want to be doing this. Um, and here's an analogy taken from Kim Beller, Kim, Tim Keller's book, <laughs> and um, it's there on your handout, Olga, if you'll read it. Imagine a widow has a son she raises and puts through good schools and a good university at great sacrifice to herself, for she is a woman of very slender means. And as she's raising him, she says, son, I want you to live a good life. I want you to always tell the truth, always work hard, and care for the poor. And after the young man graduates from college, he goes off into his career and life and never speaks to his mother or spends time with her. Oh, he may send her a card on her birthday, but he never phones or visits. What if you asked him about his relationship with his mother and he responded, no, I don't have anything to do with her personally, but I always tell the truth, work hard and care for the poor. I've lived a good life. That's all that matters, isn't it? Well, we know that's not all that matters, and yet a lot of people are going about their spiritual life in that way, and doing all the things God says, but they have no personal relationship with him. It's not enough. We owe Jesus literally everything, because everything we have comes from him. And he deserves to be at the center of our lives. And even if we're good people, but we're not letting God be God, not really following him, not really abiding in Jesus. We are just as guilty of sin as Nicodemus was or as the Samaritan woman was. We're being our own savior. Where might you still be doing that? We want to instead put Jesus in front of everything, everything. We get to put him in front of our loved ones, our careers, our money, our morality, our striving, our own efforts, because every other savior but Jesus is really not a savior. Jesus is the only savior and He's the one, and when we gain him, he will satisfy us. And when we fail him, he will forgive us. And Keller says, our families, our performance, our career cannot die for our sins. And so you know what this is really about is, you know the, the parable of the four soils? And you've got the rock, rocky soil, and you've got the thorny soil, and then you've got um, well, the first one is just doesn't even get into the soil. It's just on the side of the road. And so the third soil is the one where there's thorns and things that crowd out the seed. The fourth soil is the only one where it's the good soil. And if, any time that we're putting anything in front of Jesus, any kind of worry, I mean, oh, I'm so worried about this or that or what. We're in the third soil. Now that's a believer, but they're not fourth soil believers. It's the only time when you're putting Jesus in front of everything that you're really living in that fourth soil. And that's my aim. So throughout the day, if something happens and all of a sudden I've got to worry or care or oof, I'm in the third soil. Get to the fourth soil. And it's just a reminder. And so... Now, if we continue reading in chapter 4, we see, this is beautiful, the Samaritan woman, she runs off and tells all her friends about the living water she's found. She testifies to meeting Messiah, invites everyone to go and meet him too. Now, think about it. She was there all by herself in the middle of the day because she was avoiding all these people that she now ran off to to tell about him. Jesus makes a difference. We no longer have to... 
She was so sh ashamed. And when she met Jesus, now she could, with her head held high, go to those same people and proclaim Christ. What a difference he makes. And, and so we see that, you know, nothing's recorded of Nicodemus acting that way. And it reminded me of, and I pulled it from the message in Luke 7. She was forgiven many, many sins, and so she is very, very grateful. If the forgiveness is minimal, the gratitude is minimal. When we see what he has done for us, we want to be like her, don't we? But remember, why did she find salvation? It was because Jesus was thirsty. If he had not been thirsty, he would have not gone to the well. She would have not have found the living water. But back up from there, why was he thirsty? He was thirsty because the divine Son of God, the maker of heaven and earth, had emptied himself of his glory and descended into the world as a vulnerable, mortal subject to becoming weary and thirsty. And he emptied himself of all the glory and chose to come and be thirsty for us. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. This woman found the living water because Jesus said, I thirst. And that wasn't the last time Jesus said that. If we go to the end of the book of John, when Jesus was on the cross. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. He meant more than a physical thirst, because Jesus was experiencing the loss of the relationship with his father. He was taking on the punishment that we deserved for our sins, and he was cut off from the father, the source of living water. And he was experiencing the ultimate, torturous, killing, eternal thirst of which the worst death by dehydration is only a hint. Jesus Christ experienced cosmic thirst on the cross so that you and I can have our spiritual thirst satisfied. And it's because he died that we can be born again, and he did it gladly. So seeing what he did and why he did it, how can we not turn our hearts toward him in worship? How can we not turn away from the worthless things and receive that living water that he has come to give us? And so what are you still holding on to? Will you let go of anything that you're still putting in front of him and ask him to help you receive what he has come to give you, what he longs to pour into your heart, what he longs to displace whatever that thing is? I have been called by God my Savior, and Christ Jesus is my hope. God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And now if you will read there the Transforming Prayer by Ken Boa. 
Lord Jesus, you have gone to such amazing lengths to make it possible for us to have life in you. You have transferred me from a condition of depravity, alienation, futility, emptiness, and hopelessness to an entirely new position of purity, fellowship, meaning, fullness, and hope. I give thanks for your grace in which you exchanged the boundless glory and majesty of heaven for the poverty and suffering of earth. Your poverty has made me rich. Your love has lifted me up. Your grace has given me hope. Your suffering has given me life. I thank you and bless your name, the name which is above every name, at which all who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow and acknowledge that you are Lord. You have called me to a life of fullness and purpose as I derive these from your life in and through me. Amen. Okay. Thoughts or comments? We have some time for discussion now. I believe the Bible is true when I read the story of... Um, of the encounter at the well. And that was the first time he told anybody he was the Messiah. It just, I, it was so countercultural for that time. I, I knew it had to be valid. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, I mean, that was so un, unheard of that it had to be, you know, inspired from God. Mm -hmm. Anyway. It's not something that a normal person would write no. to have happen. But you have to really understand the culture of that time to get that, too. Because, you know, for us, we live in a very different culture. But in that day, it really was just amazing. So countercultural, so counter yes. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to, for me, people in my life that don't believe that are actually, like, poking at me and my faith and trying to sh take it apart. It is so hard to think God loves them as much as he loves me. And I am just as bad a sinner. And so this is a very, maybe we're all quiet because this is very convicting <laughs> message. <laughs> it's pretty heavy, <laughs> but I love that analogy. So true. Mm -hmm. I just find that being raised the way I was raised, there's so much that I get to unlearn. I had a wonderful upbringing, wonderful parents and all. But my takeaway was more of a legalistic approach where I was just so, it was so driven into me, especially as a preacher's kid, about what I did, so much about doing that. Um, it's just hard to wrap my ra mind around the truth that really I don't contribute. Now, there is reward in heaven for, for the good. You know, the, the wood, hay, and straw is going to be burned up. And that would be the things that we do in our own strength, the things that, you know, they're meaningless. The precious stones are the things that he calls us to do and he does through us and those, those remain and there will be greater reward for those things when we're in heaven. So it's not like works have, you know, but the works follow the faith. And that was the part that me growing up, I had that mixed up. In my mind, I had to be a good little girl. I was going to make God mad. And, um, and I constantly felt like he was mad because I couldn't always be a good little girl. <laughs> And yet how I find even now I can fall into that faulty thinking. And, and so it's where I want to stop and just say, I'm in the third soil when I'm thinking that way. I don't want to live in the third soil. And so 
it's the so my I think maybe I mentioned before you know how I've been doing this thing for a few years now where you pick a word for the year instead of your list of resolutions just a word and this year my word is in in this moment am I in Christ or am I in the flesh you know because it is a throughout the day moment by moment choice and so the word in for me is just like the reconnect, you know, because I find myself so often just stepping out of that. And so it's it's the abiding, getting back into abiding, and the not striving. And, you know, like even today with the storm and yesterday, what, you know, what should we do? Is it going to be too terrible of a storm? And we, a lot of us were talking and communicating and it's like, Jesus, this is your deal. I put you in front of this. And then everything just became clear. And so why did I wait? Why did it take so long <laughs> to get to that place? I'm just saying this. So um, I just want to let him teach me more and more about this way of living that um, is just letting him move through me and just me being in him instead of out. So I'm reading a devotional called In Christ by E. Stanley Jones. And then Ray Steadman, all of a sudden, you know, he, I was following him last year and now his whole theme this year is In Christ. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is confirmation. It's in. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments? Or we can all go home and, you know, I guess I'm not, I'm going to be here for another noon, but maybe we want to get on the road before, I guess the rain is supposed to start peaking around noon, so we can close if you guys don't want to continue discussing the lesson. One of the things that came yesterday, though, when I was thinking about, when we were hearing reports that this was going to be really bad rain, I, at one point I thought, okay, maybe what we do is we, as community, choose to use the hour we would have been together in solitude and let him rain down on us a personal encounter with Jesus. Maybe we all just take time to be all alone with Jesus. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool to do and see what comes of it. We could report back, but it just became clear we were to get together. So anyway, <laughs> it was a thought. Um, Faye. I debated um, telling this because it's complicated and whatever, but <laughs> your couple of comments um, made me think I need to share. Um, I, bottom line, it's very easy to slip into plain God without realizing it, which I realized just the last few days. Um, most of you, or many of you know I'm moving, and it's going to be complicated by the fact that I don't know where I'm going to be moving until I sell my house. And then it's going to be really fast <laughs> to get everything done and everything. So I keep trying to take a day at a time and everything, but I'm always looking up places online. And I saw a place um, the other day that was gorgeous and it would, had pretty much everything I wanted and everything. Um, the trouble was it would require uh, my son to to buy the house because it was a you know it was per, it was like the mother-in-law quarters but absolutely with everything in it even its own garage and I got all excited because I saw how beautiful it was would be for them you know things that it had that they didn't have in their house even though they moved, you know, two years ago. So I got all excited. I called him, talked to him about it. And he kind of is like me, where he likes looking at places, too, and everything. And so he recognized it was really beautiful. And he said, in theory, it would be great, but I don't think we can afford it, even with your input, because I would put the input. But it would take a big burden off me not having to wait. <laughs> 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 and not have to worry about moving in the right time because they'd already be there and everything. And, uh, you know, I, I know that the Lord has a place already picked out for me. I know that. 
but I get impatient and it's hard. And I thought about it and I started feeling more and more anxious about it. And I finally had to write a text to uh, email to my son and apologize. I said, because, well, bottom line, I'd taken, you know, I played God. I took everything into my own hands instead of waiting that I know I'm supposed to do. And, you know, I, I felt bad because I felt it could have impacted them discussing about it and them wanting to, to do it, but maybe getting in over their head and everything like that. So I realized I'd really complicated it. And, um, of course, I felt much better. And I knew, I said, I go by um, trusting the Lord by the peace I get. I said, I haven't had any peace about this. I've had anxiety. And, you know, it seems like it was maybe a minor thing, but it's very easy to slip into that. You know, save you know, save ourselves a shortcut. Try to make it work, mm -hmm. jam in. But uh, I know how crucial it is to wait mm -hmm. for the right timing. Wait and trust. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.